Hello, Wicked members. My name is Maya Shukari, and I am Wicked's Education Committee Director. I'm happy to introduce our series, Finding Your Niche. In this series, we will interview female criminal defense lawyers who practice in a specific area within criminal law. The goal of our series is to highlight the work and accomplishments of female criminal defense lawyers, but it is also a way for us to introduce you to specialty areas within criminal law. We hope we can help you find your niche. Enjoy the series. Good morning, Roots. How are you? I'm well, thank you, Maya. Thank you for having me on your show. Well, it's my pleasure. I'm very happy that you're here with us, especially after you received the Wicked Award, the very first award that we awarded to a female lawyer, and we're very happy that it went to you. So congratulations on the award. Thank you again. I am, uh, as I was saying earlier, I'm truly humbled by, by the fact that members of uh, Wicked and my peers um, gave me this honor, and I, I really am. I'm very grateful. It came at the right time. Very happy to hear that and very well deserved. So, uh, Roots, I'm going to start by asking you the first question that I ask in this interview, and it's what is your niche? Ah, um, so, you know, I was contemplating that concept of a niche when um, we were in preparation for this specific interview. And, and I think what happens is when you first begin your practice, um, you, you basically take what comes in the door, right? Uh, financial stability and getting your feet wet, I think, requires you to accept whatever you can. Um, I mean, unless, of course, you're independently wealthy and you can pick and choose your files. Yeah. Uh, the first few years of your practice, you're grabbing whatever file you can and learning everything there is to learn about that brief. Um, so when I started as a sole practitioner, I, I took files but understood the importance of having senior counsel mentor me. Um, I would take files and bounce ideas off of uh, other counsel to get a better sense of how to approach a file strategically. And uh, there were some files, I have to admit, that in my early years were out of the breadth of my knowledge. And I would bring senior counsel on to work on that file as their junior. And so, in doing that, uh, while I was developing my skills uh, in that area, um, I realized there were certain things that I was really good at in my early mm -hmm. years. And one of those things, for example, if we were going to call it a niche, I was, I was really good at bails. So I would do bail hearings. And um, to a certain extent, I would offer my services to uh, senior counsel in Toronto and um, say, I'll do your bail and send the file to you. Um, so they would call me to run their bail hearings for them. Um, and uh, many of them had seen the type of work I did with bail, so they already knew I was good at them. But that became a niche that I kind of exploited in order to uh, de develop um, relationships with counsel at the bar. And so for me, I think my first area or foray into uh, developing my skill set was with bail hearings. Um, mm -hmm. And much of that was obviously from um, having been duty counsel in the GTA and having learned a lot of that, um, uh, the value of doing bail hearings and doing them properly from a very early stage in my career. Um, so that was my first kind of niche, if you want to call it a niche. Okay, um, yes. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and so, but then did you develop other uh, niche areas? I did. Um, I found that, um, you know, by keeping the bail hearing, for example, I would, get, I would keep the fees for the bail hearing, sending them back to senior counsel. I was then getting um, work. And this is, this goes to the whole idea of getting work as well, right? You, mm -hmm. you can't in your early years say, I'm only going to do homicide trials um it's not going to happen to you. Yeah. you or i'm only going to do sex assault trials so you know you have to you have to try everything you have to test the water see what you're really good at before you can say i'm developing a niche in an area um, um a lot of the um, 
uh, arrangements that I made with senior counsel uh, allowed me um, not only to get the monochrome name or of a uh, bail hearing queen, but I, I went on to uh, regularly assist counsel as their junior on many of the files uh, that I had done the bail hearings for. Mm -hmm. And so I got an opportunity to do some very choice work. Um, many of the senior lawyers that I had aligned myself on uh, very early on in my practice uh, were effectively in-house counsel for a particular biker gang, if I can call it that. And um, I would do the bail hearings for many of the lesser members, uh, sometimes the girlfriends or the wives or the mistresses right. of the biker um, yeah. or their children, in fact. Um, yeah. And as a result, uh, the senior counsel would usually toss me sometimes the lesser lower member also in the project um, as a co-accused. And so all of a sudden I began developing uh, a niche for guns and gang style prosecutions, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, a brilliant area to learn from because there'll always be senior counsel in the room that you get to watch. Right. And so I was doing uh, effectively biker prosecutions um, as a junior uh, with maybe a co-accused. And this was before the guns and gangs unit was a thing, right? So getting that type of um, uh, access to things like um, wiretap cases, uh, significant surveillance cases, uh, things that I could really sink my teeth into, but I had a, a, a number of senior counsel around me who I could not only watch and learn from, but that I could bounce ideas off of. And so that became um, a niche area for a number of years. Um, and through that, uh, an interesting kind of development in my, in my uh, type of work. And that was specifically seized property, return of seized property and monies uh, for legal fees. Um, mm -hmm. because that's a huge area in those large gang um, prosecutions where they take in vast amount of monies right. and property from these individuals. And this is also before civil remedies was a thing. Um, and it's a bit harder now to do that area, um, partially because of civil remedies, which I consider to be, you know, the government's legalized uh, theft ring, uh, mm -hmm. stealing, people, stealing people's money and, and their homes. Yeah property. Um, but it's still a really good area for any young counsel to explore and know that area because it's significant um, in that way to uh, to not only get your fees paid sometimes, but also to develop that um, niche area that you can yeah. have clients with. You may not be able to do their full case for uh, another lawyer, but that's a specific area that you can find and develop and uh, offer your services um, contractually, right? So, but that's very interesting because it seems that in your case, you've had several niches and they've all kind of developed one from the other, from the previous one, like bail then led you to work on specific types of cases. And then you developed like a gang, uh, guns and gang kind of a niche and then into the uh, property and legal fees niche. So it's very interesting that one niche can actually lead you to another one afterwards. But yeah. I wanted to ask you, uh, uh, Ruth, so, uh, so it seems like you started off as a sole practitioner, the practice of law. Okay, right. So you were able to develop that niche even without being in a firm. So yeah. even on your own, you slowly developed your own niche and then you you're still you still have your firm with the different types of niche right now yeah i i you know when you when you first start off if you're not in a firm uh you really have to make the effort to um align yourself with a few senior counsel mm -hmm. um, mentorship is crucial in this business because the truth of the matter is we're not really taught the practice of criminal defense. Work That's right. In law school. That's right. And, you know, you can, you can learn the law and, you know, the charter and the Oaks test all in law school, but you're not going to put the practical application until you're standing in a courtroom. And uh, I was fortunate enough when I started um, very early on to, 
to be part of the duty council legal aid program in the GTA. I traveled throughout all of the various courthouses. I predominantly did bail hearings because that's what I enjoy doing. And I, I was never the person that they put into plea court because I hated doing guilty pleas. Um, so you, you develop a sense of what needs to be done and it becomes uh, a part of your repertoire. And so for, for me to foray from that into private practice, when bails are probably one of the most significant components of a defense lawyer's repertoire, um, you, you know that you have to be able to choose your files um, one, because you have to say yes to everything that comes in the door, but two, that you have to, you have to service that client and getting them out on bail is probably one of the first and uh, most important things that you need to be right. able to do. So uh, for every young lawyer out there, um, I am a, a firm believer that you, even in this day and age of Zoom technology, go and sit in bail court, watch bail hearings happen. Uh, pay attention to the type of submissions that are being made, understand bail hearings, and then offer your services. There are a lot of, you know, a lot of lawyers may not always be able to attend bail court. And they, and if you align yourself with a lawyer who has a busy practice and uh, needs your services to say, can you do a bail hearing in a pinch, um, you will get access to a number of files that you wouldn't have otherwise had access to. Mm -hmm. And it's a good development of your skill set. Um, when I did start off and I had that opportunity, I was really lucky. I had a lot of great mentors when I started. Um, and then over the years, uh, I became a mentor and started to um, hire young people who were ready to do this type of work. Um, and so for me, the the transition into being um, uh, a firm where I have young associates in my firm who are doing exactly what I was doing, which is learning, uh, getting an opportunity to sink their teeth into different types of cases that they wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity to do. Mm. Well, speaking of your firm, you do have a, an all-female firm, and that's a very interesting thing. So one thing I wanted to ask you, Ruth, was that something intentional or did it just happen that now all the lawyers that are working with you are females. So can you maybe just tell us a bit about your firm? Yeah, so I, I remember, um, and I can tell you, I remember being in law school and telling people that I wanted to have a firm that was a full service firm for women, that was a flex firm that they could come in and um, use their time flexibly. I had no idea of Zoom technology. I had no idea of virtual court at the time. But I had this image of having a firm and having a daycare in the firm. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. um, women could work from home. They could come into the office. If they had to bring their children in, they could bring their children in. Um, and it would be a full service firm that would have criminal, family, immigration, corporate, commercial, wills, and estates. Now, I haven't expanded into all of those yeah. areas <laughs> because I don't think... Um, I, I just don't think I have the wherewithal to do all that right now. But it, I think the the end game for what I envisioned, uh, you know, 25, 30 years ago about what type of practice I wanted to have um, had already been set in my mind. So perhaps somewhat intentionally, but also by accident, um, I traveled through my career, meeting people, offering opportunities for articles um, or associates. Uh, I had young men here. Um, I found uh, that to a certain extent, um, and, and not, to, not to malign uh, the other sex, but I, find that I found that the young men who would uh, be in my firm uh, tended to learn everything they could from me and then go off on their own. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the opportunities that I offered for the women to have a balanced life, and I think that's the difference between uh, women practicing um, and men practicing, is that for men, there's always somebody in the background looking after them. For women, we do it all, right? We're working, right. we're at home, we're taking care of parents, we're taking care of children. And to be in a firm designed to accommodate 
um, your needs, meaning your familial needs, the balance that you need to be able to take care of everybody um, mm -hmm. was important to me. And for the women who have joined my firm, it's important for them. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why the firm developed the way it did, because we all understood the need to uh, accommodate, to have a safe place um, where if you needed time off, um, it wasn't an issue. Nobody was questioning it. Um, if you needed to bring your child into the office, right. um, then you could. Um, it may not be the traditional law firm that uh, many people envision when they're in law school, but it's the law firm that made sense. And it looks like it's working. I, I think, uh, I mean, your firm has been a female uh, firm for for how long now? It's uh, It's been about five or six years now where okay. it's been female centric. Nice. Um, over the years before that, there were uh, a number of females who came in and out, and there were a number of males who came in and out. Right. Um, but female-centric, I would say the last five or six years. Um, to the extent that uh, the uh, women in my firm um, who are here, um, all of them came in with the idea that I had already set up the infrastructure. Um, and by setting up uh, an environment where they could come in and actually just do the law and have the mentorship, uh, that became important. For a lot of the younger junior lawyers in my office, it was a, an opportunity for them to develop their skills. Um, they weren't going to get homicides walking in the door for them. But right. being here, they got to sample those. Um, they have the opportunity to work on files like that. And so for many uh, of the people who worked for me, um, the desire to work here was because there was a good uh, basis of work that they could actually uh, learn from. And um, they also had the seniority of a number of other lawyers here who could help them through the process. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ruth, did you face any challenges in uh, your in your career due to the fact that you are a female lawyer? Yeah. And if, <laughs> you can maybe tell us a bit more about that. You know, um, I remember when I first started in this work um, as, a, as an articling student and I was with Pinkowski Law here. Um, Pink, Pinkowski Law for Printer, as it was called back then, mm -hmm. back in uh, 1995. And uh, I remember walking into court and having um, stepped past the bar. Now, admittedly, I was an articling student and not yet called to the bar, but I was still permitted to sit in those very, very precious seats that were broken down and dilapidated just beyond the bar. Um, and uh, having, having a particular judge out in Scarborough uh, berate me because he thought I was um, an accused person. Um, and I've been in court um, as a young lawyer, standing in the hallways, uh, being approached by Crown attorneys or police officers thinking I was the interpreter, or I was the secretary, or I was the girlfriend of accused, but never the lawyer. And right. Uh, I mean, let's be clear, my time as duty counsel and becoming a young lawyer told most of the GTA who I was, so I wasn't worried, but the outside courts, the outer jurisdictions, um, I was always having issues. Uh, it took a number of years before places out in Kitchener and Guelph and Waterloo and Windsor and London, Ontario started to realize, oh no, that's counsel. <laughs> So yeah. um, that was that was definitely one of the issues. It was a um, also a predominantly uh, boys club thirty years ago. Um, there were very few women practicing criminal defense work, um, and those that were in this profession quickly left. Um, the rate of uh, female 
defense counsel who needed to leave. And we all understand the reasons why, you know, mm -hmm. they wanted stability. They want to have um, a, a, a sense of knowing that it's more of a nine to five thing so they can get home and make dinner um, and take care of the children or uh, their families. So it's not surprising that many of them would leave. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons why I think the firm makes sense for me, my firm. Yes. Because, um, and especially now, like more so now than ever before, with virtual court, there is absolutely no reason why women have to leave criminal defense work. Um, you can make it work now. You can make and and have everything that you want. If you want a family, you can have a family. If you want to, uh, you know, have dinner with your husband in the evenings, you can do that, right? Um, you don't have to. You don't have to uh, choose between your career anymore. And so I'm hopeful that uh, many young young women who choose this area will continue to stay in this area. I hope so too. And for that, I wanted to ask you, so I know you did mention a few things earlier in this interview about this point, but uh, for, for someone who's watching this interview right now and who wants to start a practice, especially if they're on their own and they, they're inspired by the fact that you were a sole practitioner when you started, I mean, you're still on your own, you're the main uh, uh, lawyer <laughs> boss in, in the firm. Yeah. <laughs> So, but what advice would you give for people who want to start, who are maybe a bit discouraged because of what we hear right now, that things are not going very well for the defense bar. What advice would you give them to, first of all, to stay in the practice, to, to continue doing and to start to practice if they want to. And if they are already practicing, but they feel like they're struggling, uh, what advice would you give them um, um, you know, as a boost? <clears throat> You don't get into criminal law for the money. I hope everybody recognizes that. <laughs> I think it comes, and I and and don't doubt that for a moment. There will be a point where you will be pleasantly surprised about uh, how financially stable you can be in this profession. It will come, but we've always had uh, troubling moments for the defense bar. Even when I articled back in 95, 96, there was a complete um, uh, ban of legal aid because of the way legal aid had um, undermined the defense bar. Um, so I was walking into criminal defense work knowing that the, the one um, area that I could uh, secure financial stability from was not going to be secure. It'll always be uh, an, a tumultuous um, area of practice. But if you love this work, and you have to love this work. So I think that's the first question. Do you love criminal defense work? Because mm -hmm. if you do, you have to stick it through. Um, you have to figure out a way of making it work. Um, work with other lawyers. Find people that, that you can associate and align yourself with. Um, give your time to uh, a senior lawyer and say, look, I'd like to make a deal with you. I'll do the following things for you if you let me sit in on your cases. Watch cases. Go and see files in court. Zoom makes things so much easier now. Jump online and watch a, a trial take place. But don't give up because if you love this business, the end result will be that you can develop not only an amazing practice, but uh, uh, align yourself with a group of people that could be a part of your firm or could be a part of the chambers. Um, all of which uh, will give you a significant amount of um, joy and pride uh, to do this work and make you happy for the rest of your life. If you don't like this work, then this is the right time to make that decision and right. a different area of law. Thank you so much, Ruth, for this amazing interview. It was really nice to hear from you and to hear a bit about your 
practice, how you developed your practice. And thank you for the, uh, the advice that you, you gave us today. Uh, and I'm sure all our Wicked members will really benefit from the advice that you're giving us today. So thank you for your time and uh, good luck with everything and the firm. And hopefully you'll have more female lawyers joining your firm in the future. <laughs> I, I, I can only hope that it grows bigger and better. And I'm only yes. hoping the female defense bar within the criminal defense bar grows bigger and better. And just uh, as a one final uh, question, how many lawyers are you in the firm right now? We have, uh, including myself, there's four of us. Mm -hmm. And we have a uh, disclosure clerk uh, to manage all the disclosure that we, get, we have coming in. Um, and I'm hoping that my disclosure clerk will eventually be an associate in our office. So the firm is growing. Um, mm -hmm. That is the intention to to have that space. And I think I think um, the time is right to have all women firms out there because we uh, well, we offer a lot more than most people realize. Yeah, uh, we're, we're capable of um, a, a considerable amount of skills in this in this line of work, and we have the we have the table manners to do it. So, and hopefully, the babies who are now in the firm will grow up and become lawyers in the firm as well. I, I have anticipation of at least one of the four children or the yeah. who have been raised here will become a lawyer. We'll see. Yes. Well, good luck, and hopefully, that will become true. That would be great. All right. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you.